Once again, good morning. Would you turn your Bibles with me, please, to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Last week, we revisited the history of Mary and Martha and Lazarus and their bond, their love for Jesus. And last week, we only made it through the six first verses of this incredible chapter, and we saw the difficult truth of how God's love sometimes waits. This morning, our verses continue to describe the captivating drama that unfolds from the unexpected and seemingly untimely death of Lazarus. And this morning, we're only going to be studying verses 7 through 33. So I think we'll get through John 11 next week, maybe in two weeks. There's just a lot to unpack here. The title of our message this morning is simply The Resurrection and the Life. That's who Jesus is. Could I ask you to stand with me as we read verses 1 through 7? We'll give ourselves a reminder of the events in John 11. So let's read verses 1 through 7 of God's holy word. John 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Father, we're here because we desperately need your Holy Spirit to speak to us. Father, would you guard our minds this morning? Lord, may we have humbled hearts, surrendered hearts, ready hearts to hear what it is you have to say to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. The messenger has long since come and gone. He's swiftly returned to Bethany to relay to the sisters Jesus' response to the news that Lazarus is sick. And we see that Jesus has tarried in the area for two days. And now in verse 7, according to his perfect will and according to his perfect timing, Jesus now departs to Bethany. Let's read verse 7 again. Then after this, Jesus said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. Now you and I know as Bible students that Jesus could have healed Lazarus from a distance. Jesus didn't need to physically go to Bethany, did he, to perform a miracle? In fact, we've read in our earlier studies of the Gospels how Jesus had healed both a centurion's servant and a nobleman's son from a distance just with his spoken word. But as the verses go on, we'll see that Jesus has much more in mind than only raising Lazarus from the dead. Verse 8, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you? And you are going there again? Jesus' decision to return to the Jerusalem area in Judea seems crazy to the disciples. So they feel compelled. You know, they're Jesus' friends. So they feel compelled to remind Jesus, as though he needed a reminder, that the religious leaders had nearly just stoned him. Remember, we studied that a couple weeks ago in John chapter 10. But this raises an interesting question for us to ponder. Did the disciples think that Jesus didn't rush to Lazarus' aid because Jesus was somehow fearful of these religious leaders? Perhaps. Now remember, 
We're in the last few weeks of Jesus' earthly ministry. The disciples have seen all of the miracles that we've studied, right? They've seen the feeding of the 5,000. They've seen Jesus cast out demons. They've seen the healing of the lame and the mute and the blind, calming the wind and the waves. They've seen the power of Jesus, and they say, uh, Lord, what about the bad guys over there? Verse 9, Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. Now, both the Jews and the Romans commonly regarded the daylight hours as 12 hours and the nighttime hours as the other 12 hours. So here Jesus is simply referring to the daylight hours. Verse 10, look what he says. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Have you ever for fun just decided to try to run with your eyes closed and see what happens? I would encourage you not to. I've tried it. It's not fun. We talked last week about the parallels between John chapter 11 and John chapter 9. And here we see another parallel. Do you remember what Jesus said in John 9, 4? Look up on your screen with me. Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Jesus isn't afraid to return to the area because his hour had not yet come. So Jesus responds to the bewildered disciples by saying he still had work to do. And folks, while we're here, We still have work to do for the kingdom of God too, don't we? Verse 11. These things Jesus said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Now, this isn't the only time that we see Jesus describe death as sleep. Jesus said of Jairus' daughter that she was asleep. Look at Matthew 9, 24. Jesus said to them, make room for the girl is not dead, but sleeping, and they ridiculed him. Now, we know in a few verses that Jesus is going to say it plainly. Lazarus is dead. But I want you to notice something with me, and you may even want to underline it in your Bible in verse 11. He's still Lazarus even though he's dead. Lazarus didn't become Bob or Barney or someone else. Even in death, he's the same person. I believe when we get to heaven, we will still, even in our new glorified resurrected bodies, we will still have some recognition of one another. I'm not going to suddenly become Frank. I'm Brian. Now, our English word cemetery means sleeping place. That's what it's translated. Why? Because death is not the end of the story. I've heard death so properly described as being the foyer to eternity. Isn't that the truth? Verse 12. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. The disciples aren't following what Jesus is saying, are they? They say, hey, Jesus, if Lazarus is sleeping, then this is good. When you're sick, you need your rest, right? You need to recuperate. Don't wake him up, Lord. Now, remember, this is the apostles, not the B-postles. These are Jesus' closest. I know that was terrible, but you get what I'm saying. (laughs) These are his closest companions who have been there. Every step of the way. And it's going right over their head. They're just not catching on. Verse 13. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Look at verse 15 carefully with me. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there 
that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Jesus doesn't say, I'm glad Lazarus has died. Jesus doesn't say, I'm glad there's a bunch of broken hearts and buckets full of tears. That's not what Jesus is saying at all. Look at it again with me. He says, I'm glad I wasn't there for your sakes that you may believe. See, Mary and Martha desperately wanted a healing for their brother Lazarus, didn't they? We studied this last week. Yet Jesus wanted something far more. Jesus' intentions are way beyond the comprehension of Mary and Martha here, aren't they? Throughout the Bible and in our lives, we see countless times how God is much more interested in our faith growing than he is in our comfort. I don't like that. You probably don't like that either. But that's God's love and his plan for us. This is relatively easy to comprehend and intellectualize as we read these accounts in the Bible and we know how the events play out. We can even come to a sense of peace about God's will for our lives as we're looking in the rearview mirror of the past experiences of our own lives. But recognizing and submitting to God's sovereignty and his will while we're in the midst of horrific storms is an entirely different challenge, isn't it? But that is the hallmark. That is the watermark. That is the proof of faith. Jesus says he's glad that he was not there, that he was not present when Lazarus died. Why? Because the disciples were going to learn additional truths that would strengthen their faith. Every new trial you and I take part in becomes an opportunity for us to strengthen our faith. Verse 16. Then Thomas, who is called the twin said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> you all know someone like this, don't you? <laughs> Most people know the apostle Thomas as doubting Thomas for his skeptical attitude. But don't skip past Thomas's devotion to Jesus here. He says he's ready to die with Jesus. Except that's not what Jesus said. He said Lazarus is dead. Jesus' time has not yet come. Thomas is just a little bit pessimistic, isn't he? Heard the story of an optimistic fellow who took his pessimistic friend out duck hunting. And the optimistic friend really wanted to show off his new hound dog. But the pessimist looked at the dog with a frown and just kind of growled and said, well, that just looks like some mangely mutt to me. Soon, some ducks flew overhead, and bam, bam, two ducks fell out of the sky. And the pessimistic owner of the dog, or the optimistic owner of the dog, says, all right, boy, time to shine. Go get those ducks. And the dog runs on top of the water. True story. Just kidding. <laughs> Catches the ducks and runs back across the lake with the ducks in his mouth. And now the optimistic man is looking there. He's like, hey, what do you think of my dog now? The pessimistic, pessimist just kind of frowns. He says, man, your dumb dog doesn't even know how to swim. <laughs> That's like Thomas. His cup was always half empty instead of half full. Are you that way with the Lord? Is everything just kind of viewed through the lens of pessimism? I guess I just got to go pick up my cross, follow the Lord, no bother, the Eeyore Christian. It's interesting that Thomas is called the twin. 
Who was this twin? We don't know for sure. We're never told. Some theologians believe that Jesus called him a twin, indicating that faith and unbelief were twins in his nature. But again, we can't say for sure. Verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Jesus had been in the Judean wilderness, east of the Jordan River. Remember, he's about 20 miles or so away from Bethany. And it would take Mary and Martha's messenger at least one day to get to Jesus. We studied last week how Jesus tarried two more days, now bringing us to three days. And now it takes Jesus an entire day to go back to Bethany, so at least four days. This all means that Lazarus had died shortly after the messenger had departed. By the time the messenger returned to Mary and Martha, Jesus' message in verse 4, you remember what he said? Look at verse 4. This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. This promise surely seemed like an empty promise. Because Lazarus wasn't just sick anymore. No, Lazarus had been dead and dead for four days. Hebrew tradition said that a deceased person's spirit hovered above the body for three days, and then on the fourth day, that's when the spirit ascended to Abraham's bosom, according to the Mishnah. We're going to study all of that next week, and we're going to study a little bit of the science of decomposition and why the fourth day is significant. But think about the decomposition decomposition that would take place because you have the humidity and the heat and just the climate climate in general. But now in verse 17, Jesus has arrived. Lazarus has been buried for four days, which means the sisters, Mary and Martha, have been grieving for four days. They watched Lazarus worsen. They watched. Lazarus is breathing slow, and his eyes gloss over. Lazarus went downhill so fast. Many of you here know what it's like firsthand to have a loved one pass away like that. My mom was 46 years old when she died of cancer. I'll be 43 this year, so it's really surreal to me to be almost the same age she was when she died. And I remembered her funeral, one of my teachers telling me, oh, she was so young. And to me, I was like, well, no, 46 is kind of old. No, I'm like, man, that's young. It's really young. But with her alcoholism, the cancer that had come back, she had it a few years before that, the cancer had come back and was just ravishing her internal organs, especially her liver. We didn't have hospice or any help, so my dad and I took care of her the best that we could. And at first, her prognosis was somewhat favorable, but the constant routine of chemotherapy and radiation, as that played out, the cancer really multiplied at an unfathomable pace. I'll never forget the day that Dr. Hansen, our doctor, called and told us to get a hospital bed because my mom had maybe two weeks to live or so. So my dad got the hospital bed. We got my mom into it at about 11 a.m. that morning, and she was dead 13 hours later. It was fast. And she passed away in my father's arms. So this section of scripture makes me wonder what it must have been like for Mary and for Martha as they held Lazarus's hands as he breathed his last. The scene now shifts to the sisters, verse 18 and 19. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary, to comfort them concerning their brother. You can be sure that over the past several days, friends had come, doctors had come, perhaps even rabbis had come, yet death was still seemingly victorious. 
and now the sisters are left with severe mourning. According to custom back then, even the poorest family was to hire one flute player and several professional mourners at the death of a loved one. But notice in verse, time, verse 19, it says the word many. So you can be sure that this was a large crowd that had come to comfort Mary and Martha. Can you picture the scene in your mind? The tragic death, the many friends, the tears, the wailing, the grief, all overwhelming for sure. Verse 20. Now Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, and Mary was sitting in the house. If you remember from our earlier studies, Bethany is 2,500 feet above sea level. They're on an elevated plane, which gives you a bird's eye perspective on the happenings below. This means that the sisters could see figures traveling up into Bethany and leaving out of Bethany. And every distant silhouette that appeared to be drawing close had to bring to their mind, is that Jesus? Is he finally here? But day after day passed. But now here in verse 20, Martha gets word that Jesus is coming, and she doesn't even wait for him to get to the house. We'll learn in verse 30 that Jesus is on the outskirts when Martha meets him. Look at verse 21. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Tone of voice is so very important, isn't it? This is why emails and texts can be so difficult to discern because you don't know the tone of voice. And then throw in a misplaced comma and <laughs> it could turn into a, a downright calamity that wasn't even supposed to be. Here in verse 21, we don't know Martha's tone of voice. Is it reproof? Jesus, if you had been here, Lazarus would not have died. Was it sorrow? Lord, if you had been here, Lazarus would not have died. There's a difference there. We don't know the tone of voice. But no matter what the tone of voice was, Martha is accusing Jesus of a missed opportunity, isn't she? Maybe you're hurting this morning. And wondering why Jesus has not yet delivered you. I pray that you know that Jesus never misses an opportunity. He just works according to his timetable and not our own. Notice with me, though, in verse 21, Martha's faith was strong. But it's struggling. She had no doubt that if Jesus had come in time, he could have saved her brother's life. Verse 22, Martha says, But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Even in the midst of inconsolable heartache and grief, Martha still trusts Jesus. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Martha's never gone to seminary. She never even read the New Testament. Martha doesn't even know she's going to be part of the New Testament, does she? Yet Martha trusts in the doctrine of the resurrection. 1 Thessalonians tells us, chapter 4, verse 13, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, considering those who have fallen asleep, speaking of those who die, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Can I get an amen? For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then 
We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. When we die, as Christians, the Bible tells us, we are absent from the body and present with the Lord. Yet one day, our physical bodies that will rot, and turn into dust and decompose and all of those things will be resurrected into a glorious new heavenly body. I'm thinking I might be six feet tall. (laughs) We'll have to see. Look at Isaiah 26, 19. The prophecy says, your dead shall live. Isaiah 26, Jim. Your dead shall live together with my dead body and they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. And finally, look at Daniel 12, verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting torment. Excuse me, contempt. Let's read verse 24 one more time. Martha said to him, I know that he, Lazarus, will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha's right. But she's not here for a Bible study. She doesn't have a theological problem. She's suffering from a broken heart. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. This is now the fifth I am statement of Jesus in the Gospel of John. When Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, he is declaring that he is the source for both. There is no resurrection apart from Christ, and there is no eternal life apart from Christ. Yet even beyond that, Jesus is also making a statement concerning his divine nature. Jesus does more than just give life. He is life. And because of this, death has no ultimate power or victory over him. Jesus gives this life to anyone who would believe in him. 1 John 5.11 And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Believers in Christ Jesus will experience resurrection because the life Jesus gives. It's victorious over death. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 53. For this corruptible, our corrupt fleshly bodies must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The only way to experience everlasting life is through Jesus. Verse 26, Jesus continues, And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, verse 26 in the Greek is actually a double negative. It literally reads, shall never, never die. Jesus isn't asking Martha to confirm her knowledge of doctrine or theology. He's asking her to confirm her faith in him. Verse 27. She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. A lot of folks nowadays are surprised to learn that Christ is not Jesus' last name. 
Jesus is the name the Lord gave. It's his human name that the angel gave to Mary all the way back in Luke chapter 1, right? Jesus is his name, but Christ is his title, signifying that Jesus was sent from Almighty God to be king and deliverer. So when you see Jesus Christ, it means Jesus the Messiah or Jesus the Anointed One. Jesus is his name. Christ is his title. Verse 28. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister, saying, The teacher has come, you may want to underline, and is calling for you. Martha runs home, and she whispers in Mary's ear, the Messiah, Jesus, he's calling for you. We aren't told why Martha did this in secret. It's fair to assume that Martha wanted to give Mary a few uninterrupted moments with Jesus before the crowd of other mourners surrounded him. Verse 29 through 31. As soon as Mary heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. The people are mistaken. Jesus is on the outskirts, and Mary is not headed to the tomb. She's heading to the feet of her master. And Mary, in these verses, is giving... You and I an example to follow. It's critical that we not languish at stones, but we run to the feet of our master. But notice with me too, despite the grief and the anguish, that it was not crippling to Mary. Do you see that? She rose up quickly to get to Jesus. Verse 32. Then, when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Compare verse 32 to verse 21, and you're going to see it is the exact same response. What does that tell you? How many times during these last four days Mary and Martha said this to one another? If Jesus had only been here, he wouldn't have died. How many times they must have said this to one another? So we know that Mary has the same response as Martha. Perhaps it was a different tone of voice. Maybe the same tone of voice. We don't know. Now we mentioned last week that we see this Mary, Mary of Bethany, three times in the Gospels. First in Luke 10 that we studied last week, she was at the feet of Jesus listening to him teaching. Now, here's the second time in John 11. Mary of Bethany is at the feet of Jesus, mourning. And in a few weeks, when we get to John chapter 12, we're going to see Mary of Bethany once again at the feet of Jesus, this time in worship. We're going to end our study in verse 33 this morning. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. The word groan means indignation. It speaks of anger. It speaks of angst. Jesus is angry. The word troubled means to be emotionally moved, to be stirred up. Clearly, Jesus is angry and he is stirred up. But at what? Well, Jesus has a front row view of the misery that death inflicts on humanity. 
and it was never supposed to be this way. God's creation was perfect. Yet God created mankind, you and me, to have free will, to make our own choices, to plot our own course. And that's what we see happen in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. Look and look up on your screen. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. The world had never known sin before that moment. When Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God, the whole world was plunged into sin. Nature was impacted. Earth's ecology radically changed. Disease and death entered in, and from that point on, everything changed. I wonder sometimes what it was like to be on Earth at that very moment. For the first time, animals became predators. You know, I sit in my backyard and I watch birds pluck little insects out of the sky and they devour them. And I wonder, what was it like the first time that a lion devoured its prey? What was it like the first time an animal was crying out as it was being devoured? It was never supposed to be that way. Even more agonizing than the physical death that resulted from sin, even more agonizing than that was the spiritual separation that sin created between God and all of mankind. And unless our sin is forgiven by the blood of the cross, unless our sin debt is paid by Jesus, then we stand guilty before God. Only Jesus, through his sacrifice on the cross, satisfies our sin. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus died on the cross so that you and I could be victorious over death, because we'll be spending eternity in heaven. We have nothing to fear, knowing that this is merely our home. We are merely pilgrims on a journey. In these tents of flesh, these bodies that are breaking down and getting worn. The Bible is clear. There's only one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. Yet the Bible is also crystal clear about the consequences for refusing Jesus. If a person does not have Jesus as their substitute for sins, they are still guilty of all of their sins, and they will face an eternity in hell. Jesus said this in Matthew 25, 46, And these will go away into everlasting punishment. Everlasting punishment. Punishment. I know most of you here. I don't know all of you. So perhaps there's someone here this morning that you'd say is a skeptic. Saying, you know, I just don't believe in all of that Adam and Eve and Garden of Eden stuff. I just don't believe it. You're likely to tell me that you believe in science. And I would ask you, which science? Because some of the most popular theories in the different sciences actually contradict one another. But on top of that, even more importantly, I would ask you, which scientist of that field in science do you align with? Because not all scientists universally agree. In fact, many scientists universally disagree. 
So now, which scientist exactly is the one that you follow for absolute truth? Science can't explain how matter was first created. Science cannot answer the question that no science has ever been able to explain why is there something rather than nothing. The whole universe is not here because of some accidental compression of gases and exploding and cooling off. The forming of planetary systems with special atmospheric conditions and hydrologic conditions that make it possible to support life is the design of Almighty God. You cannot logically explain that it just so happened that the earth is 93 million miles away from the sun. And the atmosphere became such a combination of nitrogen and oxygen, and it just so happened of the 79% to the 20% and the 1% ratio that the various gases allows us to breathe. Or it just so happens that the earth was a blanket of ozone, or it just so happened that there was a magnetic force circulating around the earth protecting us from cosmic rays. It just so happened that the land-to-earth ratio is two-thirds water to one-earth mass. And in all of that, that in the water, perhaps somehow the right combination of molecules of protein that happened to come together at just the right time and in the right place and under the right proportions and under the right pressure and under the right heat spontaneously to create the very first cell? Not the very first human, the very first cell? When you contemplate it, there's no way that this is all just chance. No, you were created. You were created by a God who loves you. And in the hallways of heaven, he knew in the eternity past that one day he would send his son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins and for all of yours. Why? because he wants to spend eternity with you. But it's a choice. See, we can talk all the science, we can go through all of that, but at the end of the day, the issue lies in the heart. It is not a head knowledge issue, folks. It's a heart issue. Because it's acknowledging that we really don't have control. It's acknowledging that we really don't have all the answers. It's acknowledging a need to surrender. And that's the line that so many people refuse to cross. I hope you know this morning that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. There is life in Jesus. It is an abundant life. Oh, it doesn't mean that we're out here driving million-dollar cars, Bugattis, and all that stuff. No. What Jesus does is in here. And that's what the world can't touch, is it? The world can't satisfy that. Only Jesus Christ can. I pray you know him. I pray that you're following him. That's not just an intellectual head knowledge, knowing all about Jesus, but no, it's relationship. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up, and we're going to close in prayer. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Next week, We're going to camp out for a while in the shortest verse in the Bible. It's the shortest verse, but you could spend 10 years exploring its depths. And you know the shortest verse. Jesus wept. Hebrews tells us that he makes intercessions for us. I pray that you're walking in the newness of Christ Jesus and enjoying that fellowship with him. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Father God, we thank you for your word. We praise you, Lord, and Lord, we just are so grateful that you are the resurrection of life. Lord, you are the answer. 
You are what our heart needs. Father, we recognize that we are so prone to wander, just like that old hymn says. Prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love. Father, help us to stay camped out with you. Lord, may we see things as you see things. Lord, may we look at things from an eternal perspective and not just from the perspective of our own comfort. Father, we ask that you would use us in a way that gives you the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.